Well, here's somebody who you haven't seen in a while. Have not seen this guy in a while, this young feller, this young whippersnapper, this young rock star in the making from his uh, heavily mutated fourth grade class picture. Oh boy, look at that kid. Who would have ever guessed that he would end up being the guy holding this album and waving it in front of the camera on a Wednesday night at 7 p.m. and lurking mysteriously in the back. You can see something's happening in the background there. You don't maybe know quite what, but something is happening. But since I've sort of given the game away, I guess it's time for the big reveal. It's not just a heavily mutated picture of a kid in the fourth grade. It's not just a heavily mutated picture of that same dude in 1984. It's not just another heavily mutated picture of that guy from practically the present day. It is indeed the dude himself coming at you live. 100% in the real, in the flesh, in the raw, in the right, in the wrong, I don't know. Those are purely subjective concepts. And we're not talking about subjective concepts here. We're talking about tent talks, tunes, music, and the artifacts that accompany the music, and my opinions thereof. And maybe even a few compliments or comments from you out there in the listening ether. All of you who are watching right here, right now, live on Facebook, or who might be tuned into my YouTube channel, where all episodes of Tent Talks Tunes are archived. Or maybe on Facebook itself, where all those episodes are archived. Choose your poison, kids. Choose your poison. You know, it is the dose that meets... The dose makes the poison. And I got as much dosage of Tent Talks Tunes as you could possibly want. So it's either happening live, or it's happening on the rerun, but it is happening. Tent Talks Tunes is here, baby. Let's hoist our jugs of big old Danbury tap or whatever it is you're drinking out there, wherever you are, and drink a toast to the permanent record, because that's what this is on, baby. Ah, love that hydration. Let's pick up the monitor here and see who's tuned in. Let's get a thumbnail synopsis of our viewership right now. Who and where are you from? I can't see. Ah, oh, there we go. We got Nick from South Carolina, my home state. I was born in South Carolina. We got Ray from Washington, D.C.-ish. We got Chad from the sunny south. And according to the monitor here, I have five others, but it's not going to tell me who. Whatever. If you want a name check, leave a comment. Check in. Make your presence known. Stand up and be counted. Make your voice heard. Make your words seen. It's true I am the ringleader of this three ring circus, but it ain't a circus without the participants, if you know what I mean, Jelly Bean. Oh, I see somebody popped up a second ago. Jason Green from Parts Unknown, Wait Unknown. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Yeah, it's kind of a, a short list of topics today, but it's a very deep one. Very deep. But before we get into our list of exciting and varied musical things to talk about. Let's take a quick check of the mailbox and a quick check of the bulletin board. There is something that came in the mailbox, but gosh darn it. Oh no, never mind. I take it back. Take back that gosh darn it. It is within my reach. It's off of camera range. Let me grab it, y'all. I've been on the road an awful lot lately celebrating the long, lengthy 4th of July weekend, gallivanting about with uh, a very, very dear certain special friend of mine, <laughs> checking out the sights in New York City, checking out the sights in Connecticut, eating some good vegan Jamaican and a delicious vegan chili dog we had in New York City yesterday and uh, other chow elsewhere. Good fun. So I've been doing that, and between the fact that it is a holiday, I'm sure the mail hasn't been traveling quite the way that it normally would. In other words, I only got one thing in the mail that I know of, and I actually got it out of the mailbox 
days and days and days ago. But this is an interesting package. Another one of those mysterious, enigmatic packages from somebody whose name I can't quite read, but I think it's my pal Stephen, or is it Stefan Siegel, Seigel, S-I-G-E-L, who kind of warned me that he'd be sending me something in the mail. I had gotten fair warning from Stephen Stefan. And Stephen Stefan, if you're watching right now, please let me know how to properly pronounce your name so I can do so. I don't want to come across as a complete uneducated boob. Maybe partially, but not totally, you know? But yes, I kind of got warned that he was going to be sending me some stuff in the mail. And what do you know? It's not one, not two, but three compact discs by what I'm assuming is his band, The Happy Casualties. Right off the bat, I like the name. And I like the covers. And I have not looked at the song titles yet, but I see one here called Broken Finger Waltz. That's already a very promising sign. Here's another one called Left to My Own Devices in West L.A. Very promising. And look at these dudes. Harry the cat is in the next room. He doesn't want to look at these dudes. He wants everybody's attention. But he ain't getting it unless he comes in and hops on camera. There they are. The happy casualties. So thank you, Stephen Stephan. You know for gosh darn fact that I will be listening to these. And when I listen to them, and if I think that they will fit into the format of my radio show, which is called Mr. Tent's Wild Ride, I'll be playing some of that stuff on my radio show on WNHU West Haven. Yes, I am returning to the airwaves officially sometime after July 21st. We haven't nailed down the date yet, but I have been in constant contact now with station management. We've been working out all the details, and I will be heading back to WNHU within a matter of weeks. Um, and of course, you will know exactly when and where the minute that I know when and where. So I'm very excited. For the past two and a half years, I have not been on the air. And I've got a giant pile of stuff to play on the radio for you people. Um, it's great fun coming here on Tent Talks Tunes and getting to talk about tunes. But of course, due to various rules on the internet, I really can't play a lot of tunes for you. In fact, I can not play any. But when I go on the radio, I can play any for schlugginer tune that I want. And believe me, brothers and sisters, I will. So as long as cool stuff like the Happy Casualties keeps coming in, and some of the things that you folks have been sending me over the past two and a half years, and music that I've been finding out in the field over the past two and a half years, Mr. Tent's Wild Ride is going to be a wild ride indeed for two hours every week on WNHU West Haven, 88.7 FM in Connecticut, and WNHU.org on the internet. And Harry the cat is making an awful lot of noise. Let me see. If, can you guys hear him? Of course, now he shuts his mouth. Harry, my son, come here, you guy. What's going on, dude? You get to see this live on the internet. I'm trying to call a cat and get a cat to come into the room. Harry. Oh, Harry. He heard me. Come here, guy. Come on in here. Harry, come on in here. Come on, guy. He's right there. Come on up here, dude. What's, what's all the fuss about? What are you yapping about? What's the big deal, huh? Isn't this great getting to watch me talk to a cat who's not even on camera? Harry, my guy. This is the kind of stuff that's going to be archived forever on my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. Well, guess what? Here he is. Harry the cat. The one and only. Look directly into the camera with those yellow eyes of yours. Oh, say hi to everybody. Hi, hi. Yeah, you're not in the mood, are you? You're not in the mood, are you? You're just not in the mood. He's not in the mood, but he is here. All right, dude. You came. Now you can go. Big hand for Harry the Cat, everybody. Yay! I'm going to make a star out of him yet. Let's see who's tuned in here and who's got something to say about Harry the Cat. Kit E. Cat, a very aptly named young lady from North Carolina. She's saying hi to Harry. 
TT Summer wishes me congratulations on being back on WNHU. And Larry from Connecticut, of course, loves, loves Harry the Cat. Yes. All right. So that was basically the mailbox. Let's see what's happening on the bulletin board. Well, you all heard me talking last week about the Malcolm Tent Tim Whole House tour that we're booking. And since last week, the itinerary has been filling up very nicely. Um, October 12th, it's not even on the list here, but October 12th, Tim and I will be playing in Bethel, Connecticut at Molten Java, my favorite coffee house in all of Connecticut. Tim and I will be kicking off our tour October 12th at Molten Java in Bethel. Be there and be square if you want. Just be there. October 13th, we're playing Bell Tower Records in Adams, Massachusetts. The only thing better than being at a record store is playing at a record store. And then October 14th, we're playing at the News Cafe in Providence, Rhode Island. October 15th, Willimantic Records in Willimantic, a super fine record store. Hello, Mal Inowski, if you're tuned in, greetings. We will, we will rock you. We've got on the 16th playing somewhere in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Don't know exactly where. The 17th, we're playing a house show somewhere. I don't know exactly. The 18th, we're playing in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. And on the 19th, don't know yet. The 19th is TBA. And that's going to be somewhere, hopefully, between Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, New York City. Lancaster, Pennsylvania. If anybody is in that area, is in the tri-state area, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and you want to see me and Tim Holhouse completely kick some acoustic ass on October 19th, message me. We want to play. We want to play hard. We want to play good. Those are the only ways we know how to play. We cannot do anything in a sort of half-bricking, half-acid method. We don't even know how to do that. You might wonder, how hard can a guy with an acoustic guitar rock? Book us on October 19th, and you'll find out. Come see us on any of these dates between the 12th and the 19th. You'll find out. Promesa. Promesa. What else is going on? Well, we've got on July 17th, the Punk Rock Flea Market in Southington, Connecticut. Look for an event page soon for that on Facebook and look for a personal invite from yours truly, Malcolm Tent, for I will be there set up and peddling lots of cool vinyl for you, the people, because you need cool vinyl and CDs and cassettes and Personality Plus in person. You need it. I'm going to supply it July 17th in Southington, Connecticut. And I think other than my usual exhortation for you to check out my Discogs, my eBay, and my Bandcamp under the name of TPOS, that's TPOS, get yourself some really cool music and help keep my ship afloat. I can't put it any more bluntly than that. I rock hard when I'm putting it bluntly. I rock hard when I'm drinking that good Danbury tap. I just rock hard. All right. Got more people tuned in here. Mm, Jeff Coleman, my good pal Jeff Coleman, a.k.a. King Sexy, wants to know if he can do an evil Knievel jump on October 12th. I'm going to go ahead and say yes. In Bethel, Connecticut, I think we just had a special added attraction. Jeff Coleman, a.k.a. King Sexy, is going to do a live Evil Knievel jump at Molten Java on October 12th in Bethel, Connecticut. And you might not know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about, and I'm going to tell you guys this is really good stuff. Jeff, if you're still watching, perhaps you could post a YouTube link to one of your evil Knievel jumps so people can see what we're talking about and why this is so exciting. Special extra added attraction. Jeff, please post the link and all you people, please click on the link. 
and check it out. Because it's one thing to see it on YouTube, something else entirely to experience it in person. I am wigged out at the very thought of it. Excuse me. That's one of those human bodily functions that I have no control over. <clears throat> all right. What do you say we all get together and talk tunes? <clears throat> one of my favorite rock and roll stories is the story of The Clash. Now, as you've probably gleaned by now, I'm in the business. I buy records, I sell records, I trade records. I'm a huge music nerd, a music geek, a music buff, a music fan. Uh, I'm amused by music, I'm fascinated by music, and records, and the personalities behind them. So I think about things a lot when it comes to some of my very favorite bands. And The Clash... I mean, The Clash. I don't need to explain The Clash. If you're watching, you know The Clash. But, if you're watching, well, it's not really a but, I would probably say, and if you're watching, you probably have an appreciation for the deep backstories behind certain bands. And um, I'm, I just love that stuff. I'm fascinated by the, the deep, not always well-documented stories behind bands and, and how certain albums get made and why certain decisions are made about bands and how bands' careers turn out the way I do, with the way they do. And the story of The Clash is definitely one of those sick, twisted, Byzantine, ridiculous stories of management, mismanagement, personality conflicts, egos, drugs, everything you possibly want to know or have in a rock and roll story can be found in the story of The Clash. And in thinking about The Clash and how their story plays out, it occurred to me that their story plays out very, very similarly to that of another favorite band of mine, which is The Velvet Underground. Now, The Clash and The Velvet Underground really don't have a whole lot in common with the possible exception of Nick of Mick Jones stealing the guitar riff of Venus and Furs and dropping it into the Clash's version of Armageddon Time which took me years to notice and if you haven't heard it listen to them back to back listen to the Clash doing Armageddon Time and then listen to Venus and Furs by the Velvet Underground tell me it isn't so Mick Jones stole that guitar riff note for note from the Velvet Underground and dropped it into Armageddon time. I love this kind of stuff. So other than that, yeah, the Velvet Underground and the Clash, on the face of it, don't have much in common until you start ruminating over the story of the Clash. So what is the basic story of the Clash? Well, the way I like to think about it and the way I understand it, having read, I think, every book there is on The Clash and seen all the documentaries and listened to all the records and read all the interviews. Basically, it goes like this. There's a dude named Bernie Rhodes. And Bernie Rhodes was in London when Malcolm McLaren was, and I just use this term loosely simply for the, the uh, directness of it just because it's the easiest way to put it. And if you guys want to argue the point, please leave comments. That's what the comment section is about. I mean, to get all the different viewpoints and opinions and to get a good, lively discussion going. I love that. For argument's sake, we're just going to say that Malcolm McLaren was inventing punk rock at the same time that Bernie Rhodes was in London. And Bernie Rhodes and Malcolm McLaren had some kind of strange history. They knew each other. And pretty much everybody agrees that Bernie Rhodes was like basically a slavish acolyte of Malcolm McLaren. If Malcolm McLaren did something on a Tuesday, Bernie Rhodes was bound to try his version of it on a Wednesday. So when Malcolm McLaren put together a group called the Sex Pistols, Bernie Rhodes decided that he had to put together a punk rock band. 
even if nobody was calling it punk rock or nobody knew it as such, Malcolm McLaren had put together a band, therefore Bernie Rhodes must put together a band. He was a driven man. He was going to put together a band. So he put together a band, and that band was called, you guessed it, The Clash. And we all pretty much know the story of The Clash. But Bernie Rhodes was a key, I mean, super key player behind the scenes in the story of The Clash. Bernie Rhodes was also a very complex personality with a lot of, these days they call them issues. In my day, we call them problems. So I'm going to use the, the language and the terminology of my archaic, outmoded, outdated time in history. And I'm going to use my language and say, Bernie, Ro Bernie Rhodes had a lot of damn problems. Probably chief amongst them, megalomania, egomania, whatever you want to call it. Bernie Rhodes had this idea that he was the only reason that the clash not only existed, but succeeded. As far as he was concerned, the Clash were simply an extension of his creativity and his grand vision. And that everything that ever happened that was good from the Clash was because of him. He really believed that he was sort of the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, pulling, you know, pushing and pulling all the levers and pulling all the strings. And Bernie Rhodes had this management style, which it wasn't even Machiavellian. It was basically this kind of weird, short-sighted, divide-and-conquer strategy. Now, the way I see it, and in my opinion, the best managers of bands do what they can to hold their groups together. They smooth down the ruffled feathers. They stroke the egos when they need to. They gently put down the rampant egos to keep band harmony. They sort of have their eyes on the prize, and they make sure that the band is together as a cohesive unit to get the band to whatever the, achieve, whatever the perceived goal is. That's the manager's job. The manager's job is to hold the band together, keep it harmonious, and keep it going to make the money to make the records, to make the statement, to make sure the image is cohesive and coherent, and that things get done efficiently and as for as long as humanly possible. Bernie Rhodes had this idea that since he was the true power and the true creative force behind the clash, that all of the members of the band, all the guys on stage were disposable, they were interchangeable, that it didn't matter who was on stage so long as it was called The Clash. And so long as he, Bernie Rhodes, was behind the scenes pushing and pulling the levers and pulling the strings and controlling the image and doing all that. He really, as far as I can tell, he really honestly believed that. He also, as part of his divide and conquer strategy, figured that if he could totally control what he considered to be the key member of the band, he could control the band itself. And I'm going to guess that Bernie Rhodes was probably an excellent reader of human psychology. He was probably very adept at knowing how to read and manipulate somebody. He could probably read each member of the band's strengths and weaknesses and play up to them and, you know, exaggerate them, do whatever he had to do to get what he wanted out of them, which is kind of what a manager is supposed to do, but not the way Bernard Rhodes did it. He did it in order to divide the band and gain control over what he thought was the key man of the group. And in this case, the perceived key man was Joe Strummer. To boil it down to its simplest elements, Paul Simonon, the bass player, didn't 
pay any mind to Bernie Rhodes, didn't take him seriously, didn't really give a hoot what Bernie Rhodes said or did, wasn't going to play along with it. So Paul Simonon was not a good target. Mick Jones was adamantly opposed to Bernie Rhodes' manipulations and machinations because Mick Jones creatively was the force behind the clash. He was the guy who was responsible for the musical direction of the band. He's the reason why Joe Strummer didn't sing the same vocal melody over and over and over again in every single song, which we'll get back to. We'll get back to that in a minute or two. Mick Jones was the producer of the records. Even though he usually wasn't credited as such, it was definitely him sculpting the sound of the records. Now, Bernie Rhodes did not have any of these talents. He was not a great songwriter. It could be argued that he was not even a songwriter at all. He was not a great producer, in my opinion, and in the opinion of about 99.9% .9 of people who have heard his efforts at producing a record. And he was not a diplomat. He wanted to be all of the above, except maybe the diplomat. He wanted to be Mick Jones, basically. Simply managing a group was not enough. He wanted to be in the group. He wanted to be the guy on stage. He wanted to be the guy in the production chair. He wanted to be the dude with the glory and the recognition and the fame. But quite frankly, he didn't have the chops to pull it off. He was very good at being the wizard behind the curtain, but he was not very good at stepping out in front of the curtain and saying, hey, this is me, this is what I got, check this out. Not very good at it. So in his psyche, and this, this is something I, I would love to see a psychological study of this guy. And I should ask one of my, I have a couple of former employees who are both in the psychology business now. I should ask them about this. Somewhere in his psyche, in order to get what he wanted, it wasn't enough for him to like, you know, go out and make a solo album, for example. <clears throat> he had to, <clears throat> excuse me form the clash into a band that revolved around him. And the only way to do that would be to gain control over the key man, in this case Joe Strummer, and get rid of anybody else who stood in his way. And that is what he did, pretty much from the very, very beginning. If you get back to the very, very beginning of the clash, they were a five-piece band. It was Mick Jones, and Paul Simonon, and Keith Levine, who were the three founding members of The Clash, plus Joe Strummer, who came along a little bit later, and a rotating cast of drummers. Keith Levine was the first one to get the Bernie Rhodes treatment. He was difficult to work with. He was probably a prima donna. He definitely had his own ideas about how the band should sound, and he got the very early on in the band's career. I think he only played five or six shows with the group and definitely co-wrote one song for sure that we know of, a song called What's My Name, which is on the first Clash album. But that totally set the stage for how anybody who opposed the grand vision of the Clash was dealt with. They were chucked out. They were dispensed with immediately. Keith Levine was not given a chance to straighten out his attitude. He was not talked to. He was There was no band meeting. They just said, he's out. He's gone. He's done. All right, cool. Now Bernie Rhodes, Bernie Rhodes only has four people to manipulate instead of five. His job just got 20% easier. So rotating cast of drummers, really, until finally this dude Terry Chimes settled in to play drums on the first Clash album. Pretty sure that Terry Chimes was not ever really an official member of the Clash. So it re was really not a big deal if he was totally at odds with the other guys, which he was in a lot of different ways. But it didn't really matter because he was just sort of passing through. So Terry Chimes just sort of passes through. 
And, you know, due to a lack of a permanent drummer, at this stage of the game, Bernie Rhodes only has three members to exert control of. You know, there's a Clash song on the first album called Complete Control. Complete Control is a Bernie Rhodes phrase. He sat down and told the boys point blank, I expect complete control. And they laughed at him and wrote that song. I don't think Bernie Rhodes ever forgave them for that. Anyway, rotating drummers, they're coming, they're going. Finally, the great topper, and I think his name was pronounced Hedon. I'm going to say Hedon. Hedon. I'm from Connecticut. We would pronounce it Hedon. My reading vocabulary is far better than my spoken vocabulary when it comes to a lot of these things. So bear with an old guy. I don't know how to pronounce Stefan versus Stephen. I don't know how to pronounce Topper Hedon versus Hedon versus Hedon versus Hedon. Same deal if anybody watching can tell me the, ex the true correct pronunciation of Topper blank, please do. I might be an encyclopedia, but I'm not a dictionary. I'm well hydrated, but I'm not necessarily well pronounced. Anyway, Topper makes it into the band, and he is a full-on bona fide musical genius. Not just one of the best drummers to ever sit behind a drum kit, but songwriter, pianist, percussionist, producer, and arranger. The dude could do it all. Uh, which means Bernie Rhodes is kind of in a difficult position now because he's got four powerhouse members of the band to try to control and manipulate. Luckily for Bernie Rhodes, Topper also had a pretty bad drug habit, which came into play f around 1981 when he wasn't becoming, when he was no longer reliable, um, gigs were starting to suffer, and it became clear that something had to break. So what broke? Topper's position in the band. Just like Terry Chimes, I'm sorry, just like um, Keith Levine before him, he didn't get a warning. There was no band meeting. He wasn't talked to. They didn't offer to rehab him or clean him up. They just <sniffs> sliced his throat and dumped him in the gutter. Okay, great. Now Bernie only has three guys to control. And you got to mind, you got to remember too, this is after the Clash had already fired Bernie because they were sick of his manipulations and brought him back. Because Joe Strummer and Paul Simonon thought that life without Bernie Rhodes was kind of boring. And it's also worth remembering that the Clash did London Calling when Bernie Rhodes was not in the picture anymore. Think about that for a second. So Bernie is fired, he comes back, and already now Topper is gone. These three of these events happen pretty quickly. So we're back to sort of rotating cast of drummers. Terry Chimes comes back in again and leaves again. And then they hire a guy, Pete Howard. Excellent drummer, but only a guy for hire. He was not a full 25% member of the band. So now this is where things get really interesting. Mick Jones did not want Bernie Rhodes back in the producer's seat, I mean, back in the management seat. He did not want him back. There were a lot of things that Mick Jones did not want, but Mick Jones lacked the ability to diplomatically state his case. The way that he made his dissatisfaction known was through like a very passive aggressive way. He would pull these prima donna acts of disobedience, sort of trying to say, well, you know, you can't do anything without me which really only served to annoy the other guys in the band, which gave Bernie Rhodes his chance to say, see, see, Mick Jones, he's trouble, he's no good. You don't want him in this band anymore. All he does is cause trouble. He needs to go. He needs to get out of here. You know, and Paul Simonon is kind of like, yeah, well, whatever. And Joe Strummer, who is Bernie Rhodes' defined key man, is going, hmm, yeah, you know, maybe he's right. Maybe he's right. Maybe Bernie Rhodes does know what he's talking about. He certainly is the manager of the band, and he must know what he's talking about. So Bernie's just like twisting the screws and planting doubts and dividing a wedge between Mick and the other guys. Not trying to calm Mick's fears, not trying to hold his hand and gently stroke his ego, but sticking the knife in. 
and telling the other guys that Nick's a pain in the ass, which he is, but a manager is not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to do that when you're a manager. You're supposed to bring them together, not drive them apart. But Bernie Rhodes, remember, he wanted complete control. Complete control. And by hook or by crook, he was going to get it. So Nick Jones is a pain in the ass. Topper has been tossed out. Topper, arguably the second most powerful musical force in the Clash. And an ally of Mick Jones, as I should mention if I hadn't before. So now it's Mick versus everybody else. Terry Chimes even commented upon that when he was back in the band for about a year or so doing the Combat Rock Tour, he observed that whereas before it was everybody versus him, now it was everybody versus Mick. And the manager wasn't helping. So things finally come to a head, and as we all know, Mick Jones is given the knife across the jugular himself. And now Bernie Rhodes has exactly what he wants, complete control. He's got a hired drummer, he's got a bass player who really doesn't pay him any mind, and he's got his key man, Joe Strummer, who is basically following his every order and doing what Bernie Rhodes wants him to do. The result, of course, was this uh, album, Cut the Crap, an album which I have gone into at length, on Tent Talks Tunes, and you can find that episode on my YouTube channel. And, you know, of course, the band had already broken up before the album even came out, but the basic thing is, Bernie Rhodes, through his divide-and-conquer management style, managed himself completely out of a band. He had nothing left by the time he was managing The Clash. He had no band. He had an album that was universally derided and which was really his baby, you know. I mean, it's a Bernie Rhodes solo album for all intents and purposes. Bernie Rhodes took one of the greatest bands on the planet, even if you don't like punk rock, even if you don't like The Clash per se, you can't deny they were a fucking good band. He had them. He chopped them into little bits and managed, well, a bunch of little bits, which quickly blew away into the wind because nobody could handle the guy anymore. Bernie Rhodes managed himself out of a band. And to this very day, when you read interviews with him or read what other people have had to say about him and dealing with him, to this day he believes that he was the only force that mattered behind the clash. To this day, he will tell you that he wrote all the songs on the first album and that he did this and he did that. And if they had been smart enough to listen to him, they would have been, you know, bigger, better, more important, whatever. <clears throat> Excuse me, but he divided them and conquered them until there was nothing left to conquer. Imagine my surprise when I thought about the career of another one of my favorite bands. The Velvet Underground. Now, Velvet Underground existed a full 10 years before the clash. They existed on another continent. They existed in a, a whole different time, in a whole different place. They played an entirely different type of music. But the way that the Velvet Underground story unfolded is eerily similar to the way that the clash story unfolded. I'm going to take a quick look at the monitor here and see who's tuned in, who's got to say what. Oh, yes. Tyson Markley says that he has a Lou Reed story. LOL. Tyson, tell us. Don't just tease us. Don't be a Bernie Rhodes now, Tyson. You've told us you got the story, so now we got to hear the Lou Reed story. I personally kind of have a Lou Reed story. I almost have a Lou Reed story, and maybe someday, if you guys are really desperate enough to hear it, I'll tell it to you. 
you'd have to be pretty desperate to want to hear it though. I got, you know, I'm not I'm not saying that you guys are a bunch of desperate dans. I'm saying that my story about almost being a Lou Reed story would require some real desperation if you actually really wanted to hear it. Maybe I'm desperate enough to tell it to you. Who knows? Who knows? Anyway, as I'm sure we all know, and if we don't, here's a thumbnail synopsis of it. The Velvet Underground, as you can see, it is, as it's inferred by the name on the cover, were originally managed by Andy Warhol. And Andy Warhol was not a rock and roll manager by any sort, by any means. He was an artist and a creator and a facilitator. And people pretty much agree that that was the role he played in the Velvet Underground. That's what he would say, that's what they would say. And it worked very well for a little while um, for the Banana album for the Exploding Plastic Inevitable tour, and for the second album, White Light, White Heat. After that, things kind of drift apart. You know, Warhol had pretty much done whatever he could do. The band had done pretty much whatever he could do with Andy Warhol, and they just kind of drifted apart. Around this time, a guy named Steve Sesnick enters the picture. And Steve Sesnick is another one of those Wizard of Oz types behind the curtain, or at least fancied himself to be one of those types of dudes pulling the strings and pushing and pulling the levers and turning the wheels and making everything happen. Steve Sesnick assumed management of the Velvet Underground, I'm pretty sure after the album White Light, White Heat came out in 1968. Sesnick by all accounts, did exactly the same thing that Bernie Rhodes did. He focused his attentions on the key man of the group, which in this case was Lou Reed, and figured that everybody else was expendable, and that anybody who posed a threat to his authority or challenged his vision, whatever it might have been, of the Velvet Underground, had to go. And, well... If you look at the publishing credits for the original copies of the first Velvet Underground record, the songs are published by a company called Three Prong Music. Three Prong Music stood for the three prongs of the Velvet Underground. Lou Reed, John Cale, and Sterling Morrison. The original drummer Angus McLeese had already come and gone. The new drummer, Maureen Tucker, was not party to most of the songwriting, although her songwriting credit does appear on a few, but she was not party to all of the Machiavellian maneuverings. She didn't really care one way or another. She just wanted to play. Sterling Morrison had a real heavy-duty, passive-aggressive thing going, kind of like Mick Jones, maybe kind of like Paul Simonon a little bit. The real butting of the heads was between Lou Reed and John Cale as to who was going to be the creative force of the Velvet Underground. And when, when those guys could work in harmony, it was fantastic. Just listen, to, just listen to this record and listen to White Light, White Heat and some of the other stuff that was recorded around that time but not released until later. That sound is all about the dynamic of John Cale versus Lou Reed with Sterling Morrison chiming in his two cents and Maureen Tucker holding it all together. With such strong personalities, there's no way, so Steve Sesnick thought, that he was going to maintain complete control over this band. So one of the strong personalities had to go. As we all know, by the time 1968 was over, John Cale was gone. He was kaput. No more John Cale. John Cale, I'm going to guess, was too hard to control. Probably did not care a whit what Steve Sesnick, Steve Sesnick said. Would not obey and therefore was picked up and tossed in the narrative garbage can. Whereas Lou Reed, I'm going to guess was more malleable, more suggestible, more amenable, 
where Sterling Morrison was off on the side just kind of fuming and fussing, and Maureen Tucker was kind of rolling her eyes at the whole thing. Whatever. You've got the key man now. And after that, a hired guy named Doug Ewell. And it's, it's really kind of hard to say what Steve Sesnick's motivations might have been. You know, we already know, and it's pretty well documented, that Bernie Rhodes wanted to be the Clash. He thought he was the Clash, and he took steps to ensure that he was the Clash. Steve Sesnick, I honestly kind of have a hard time guessing. Doug Ewell has stated in interviews that Steve Sesnick's motivation was purely money. I don't know. I really, I really can't guess. I've only seen one interview with Steve Sesnick ever, and that was in the Velvet Underground Uptight book. Um, like real in-depth interview. I've seen quotes from him elsewhere where he's made similar claims to the claims that Bernie Rhodes made. I've seen it written in print that Steve Sesnick took responsibility for the exploding plastic inevitable. He said that it was his idea, that he put it all together, that he's the one who made the EPI happen, and he was the one who gave Andy Warhol the idea, and all that. So there's definitely some kind of megalomania involved, very much like Bernie Rhodes. But not by any account that I've ever seen or read or heard did Steve Sesnick fancy himself to be a creative member of the Velvet Underground. Nonetheless, he kept zeroing in on his key man and kept trying to make things happen the way that he wanted to, to the detriment of the band. Divide and conquer. Freeze out this individual and get rid of them if they're too much trouble. Focus all, focus all attention on the malleable ego of the key man and make him do what you want to do. Heard it before? We've heard it before. Now we're hearing it again. My guess is that at some point Lou Reed got sick of what was going on and rather than be aced out, he quit. Lou Reed quit his own band, The Velvet Underground, leaving behind Doug Ewell, Sterling Morrison, and Maureen Tucker. Now Doug Ewell has gone on record saying that Steve Sesnick was really greasing him. He, Doug Ewell has said that, and I'll quote, you can't con someone unless you're greedy, and I was greedy, unquote. So Sesnick was apparently going around telling people that Doug Ewell's the next Paul McCartney, and you got to check this guy out, and he's fantastic. He's the one to look out for. And once Lou Reed quit the band, Sesnick really had his key man, because Doug Ewell, by all accounts, was totally in with the program. He was young and greedy and wanted to be conned, and Steve Sesnick was ready to put that ring on his nose and lead him around. It's fascinating stuff. But the problem is Lou Reed was the main songwriter of the Velvet Underground. Steve Sesnick just managed himself out of the key songwriter and lead vocalist of the band. And he attempted to groom Doug Ewell to take his place. But once again, and Doug Ewell, who I've never met, but I really like, I would like to meet him because he strikes me as being a very honest and straightforward dude. Doug Ewell, by his own account, said, that wasn't me. You know, I was not that kind of a songwriter. I didn't have what it took. But Steve Sesnick now had total control of this thing called the Velvet Underground. He put Doug Ewell up front. They hired somebody else to take Doug, to take Lou Reed's place. Sterling Morrison quit. They hired someone else to take his place, and now Steve Sesnick has his band. The problem is the band completely lacks a strong songwriter and completely lacks a charismatic a charismatic front band front man. They also lacked a, a record contract. There was no more record contract. There was no more charismatic front band. No more songwriter. I mean, Sesnick got exactly what he wanted total control over the Velvet Underground, but there wasn't anything there. And that version of the Velvet Underground did manage to tour the U.S. a fair amount, and they did go to Europe once. 
but that was really about it. You know, Atlantic Records, who was the Velvet's final label, did not want to hear anything from the non-Lou Reed version of the band. The band did basically break up, and it gets kind of muddy there because, according to all accounts, Steve Sesnick got the Velvet Underground, such as it was, a contract for Polydor Records in the UK. But when it came time to record the album, what he did was he flew Doug Ewell over to London, but didn't tell Maureen Tucker or Walter Powers or Willie Alexander, who were the other members of the band, that this was going on. He took his key man, flew him to London, and stuck him in the studio with Ian Pace, who was Deep Purple's drummer. And the result was a Doug Ewell composed album entitled Squeeze. And very much like, boy, where did I put my props? I need a prop master for this show. Very much like the much reviled Cut the Crap, which is a product of Bernie Rhodes, you've got Squeeze, which was indirectly a product of Steve Sesnick. And I got to tell you guys, I'm once again quoting Doug Ewell himself. It's not a very good record. Doug Ewell kind of describes this as being like a 10th grade term paper. You know, he did the best he could with what he had at the time, but it wasn't much. And let's just say that this is not that. This being the album that came out before that. In the exact same fashion that this is not that, which was the previous album. You went from this to that, and you went from this to that. You went from having an actual functioning band, albeit under the duress of a megalomaniacal manager, here and here, to a band in name only controlled by a megalomaniacal manager here and here. About 10 years apart on two different continents, and playing completely different styles of music, each by a band that in its original form is justly revered. So yeah, other than the odd quote in which Steve Sesnick says, well, I was responsible for the Velvet Underground and the Exploding Plastic Inevitable, and Bernie Rhodes saying, well, I wrote all the songs on the first Clash album, and I was, I've never heard a definitive statement from either Steve Sesnick or Bernie Rhodes to refute the version of events that I just related to you. I, the fanboy, who have, you know, read the books and read the interviews and watched all the documentaries and in a couple of rare occasions actually talked to some of the principals involved. They haven't said very much over the years on this issue. I think it'd be fascinating to sit down with either of those guys and really interview them about how, what they have to say about Squeeze? What does Steve Sesnick have to say about this record? What does Bernie Rhodes in depth have to say about this record? I think that would be extremely interesting. Bernie Rhodes, Steve Sesnick, if you're out there and you want a fair, uncensored forum, let me know. Send me a message. I'd be happy to sit you down with a camera and hear what you have to say. If you think I'm full of caca doo doo, let me know. I want to hear it. I'm easy to find. And anybody out there, if you want to uh, see what I'm talking about or hear what I'm talking about, you know for a darn fact that this is, it's got to be out there on YouTube somewhere, as does this. Give it a listen. Form an opinion if you don't have one already. I'm, I'm going to say right now that I'm, I'm morbidly obsessed by these records because they're so bad. They're just so bad. Apologies to Doug Ewell, but Doug, you've, you apparently already know that. And, um, yeah, what more can I say? So, yes, eerily parallel paths by two great bands who really had nothing to do with each other. They were both managed to death and still put out albums after they were managed to death. Go figure. Go figure. 
in closing, I would like to say that I have yet to be managed to death. I manage myself, and I manage to get by. Hopefully, I can manage to get a few of you people out there to buy a copy of my album, The Multiple Moods of Malcolm Tent. This is my career-spanning retrospective. It covers the first 35 years of my career. It's got many of the bands I've been in since 1984. It's got Broken Talent, The King Hatreds, The Bunny Brains, Ultra Bunny, Anti-Scene, The Malcolm Tent Power Duo, BB Gun, They Hate Us. It's got one guy from Devo on it. It's got The Residents on it. This, even if I weren't the key man on this record, would think this is a pretty ookin' good album. I designed the cover. Steve Sesnick would have said that. Bernie Rhodes would have said that. I designed the back cover. I'm responsible for all the music on this. I made this guy what he is today. I did the, line, did the layout of the inner booklet. I wrote the liner notes. I designed the label art. I made sure it was pressed on funky colored vinyl, which you can't really see. Yeah, you can kind of see that. It's got the neat swirls and splatters and splashes on it. I can safely, safely indulge in my own megalomania with this product. I will say this album, in my opinion, is better than Cut the Crap. This album is better than the Velvet Underground Squeeze. This album does not suffer from any managerial interference whatsoever. That, like every other opinion I've just stated in Tent Talks Tunes today, is my opinion and I stand by it. How's that for a disclaimer? So check it out, kids. Discogs, eBay, Bandcamp, or from yours truly. And you can thank me later for saving the commercial until the very end of the program. Most megalomaniacal self-promoters would not do that. They'd hit you with the commercial right off the bat. I saved it for last. But this is a product that I stand by. Yep. So uh, big thanks. I've been seeing the switchboard light up in my absence. So thanks to, in no particular order, Tyson, John, Chris, Nick, Ray, Tony, Austin, Rory, and many others who I don't feel like scrolling all the way down. Alan, Shannon, Craig, Michael, Crystal, all you guys, thank you so very much for tuning in and turning on and let me rant and ramble and rage and rant and rave about bands who I really love. And uh, Lord willing, and the creeks don't rise, I'll be back in about 167 hours time. So until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State. <laughs>